my first semester at MIT, I got computer vision software that was supposed to track my face. It didn't work until I put on this white mask. I'm thinking, all right, what's going on here? Is it the lighting conditions? Is it the angle at which I'm looking at the camera? Or is there something more? That's when I started looking into issues of bias that can creep into technology. Our ideas about technology that we think are normal are actually ideas that come from a very small and homogeneous group of people. Vast amounts of data at incredible speeds. Everybody has unconscious biases, and people embed their own biases into technology. This kid got stopped as a result of facial recognition misidentification, and then used that as justification to search you. This is an innocent child. Racism is becoming mechanized. Systemic issues are only going to be hardwired into new technologies. It's not just face classification, it's any data-centric technology. Every day, we are all being scored. Who gets hired? Who gets housing? I am making predictions for your life right now. The people who own the code deploy it on other people, and there is no accountability. Management at Atlantic Towers wanted to install the facial recognition software. Pretty much turned this place into Fort Knox. The technology is being rapidly adopted, and there are no safeguards. We are socially controlled in a way that we don't see. Technology that analyzes faces could be biased, but the company is pushing it anyway. What demographic is it most effective on? White men. Show me that it's going to be fair, that it's legal, before you put it out. That's what we don't have yet. It's going to take people coming together, striving for justice in this age of automation. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Sonia Solomon. I am the research director here at the Center for Media Technology and Democracy at McGill. And I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Shalini Kantaya, the filmmaker behind the powerful documentary uh, Coded Bias, which premiered at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival. Um, and the film tracks the impacts and the real world harm of algorithmic and automated decision making. So prior to this film, um, Shalini worked or directed an episode of the National Geographic television series Breakthrough, uh, which was executive produced by Ron Howard. And her debut feature film, uh, Catching the Sun, premiered at the Los Angeles Film Festival and was named a New York Times critic pick. Um, Catching the Sun released globally on Netflix on Earth Day in 2016 with an executive producer, Leonardo DiCaprio and was nominated for the Environmental Media Association Award for Best Documentary. Um, Shalini is a TED Fellow, a William J. Fulbright Scholar, and a finalist for the ABC Disney DGA Directing Program. Uh, she's an associate of the UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism. So welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for being here. So before we begin today's event, um, I would like to give a land acknowledgement. And we do this as a symbolic and a restorative act, uh, one among many to follow, hopefully. And this is part of a wider and hopefully transformative uh, reconcilia reconciliation project that we hope to contribute to. So McGill University is situated on the traditional territory of the Kunian Kehaka, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations. We recognize and respect the Kunian Kehaka as the traditional custodians of these lands and waters on which we meet today. So we are committed to honoring our obligations to these nations, treaties, and to justice for indigenous people uh, more broadly. So just a quick note on how to participate in today's event. I think everyone should be fairly familiar with virtual participation, um, but just to briefly note, we're gonna record and post this to our website. Um, and YouTube channel and details can be found in the chat box on where you can view this uh, event. Participants can also submit a question for our speaker at any time using the chat um, button at the bottom of your screen. Um, 
And I'll just note that we have closed captioning available today. So if you click at the bottom of your screen on live transcript, and then second click into show subtitle, um, those captions should show up. Uh, and if you have any issues with that, please post it in the chat and we will try and accommodate. So I'll start with a few questions um, and then we can try and integrate the, the questions from participants as they come up, but we'll certainly have some more time at the end um, of our session as well. Um, so the film, I'll start with a general question. The film, you know, weaves personal stories, um, different artistic elements, graphic elements to really track this journey um, that Joy Bulwamini and other researchers and, and tech workers and activists, as well as impacted communities um, are on in really like holding power to account after discovering the harms of facial recognition technology, um, which is, no easy feat and no easy journey, right? So can you walk us through some of these harms? Like what are the real world impact of these kinds of technologies in, in daily life? Oh, I'm sorry, I think you're still muted. Fantastic, thank you Perfect. so much. <laughs> um, uh, thank you again to Miguel and, and to you for for having um, coded bias and for um, engaging this conversation today. Um, I basically a year ago did not know anything about algorithms or artificial intelligence, and um, I, you know my prior work had been about. Um, disruptive technologies. I've been sort of always interested in disruptive technologies and um, whether they make the world more fair, whether they give more opportunities or less and to whom. And so those have always been sort of themes in my work. And I sort of stumbled down the rabbit hole when I read Kathy O'Neill's Algorithms of Oppression and Joy uh, Sajo Boylan Weenie's um, TED Talk and then subsequently re read Meredith Broussard's um, Artificial and Intelligence and Sophia Moja Noble's Algorithms of Oppression. And I sort of stumbled down the rabbit hole of more than a decade of scholarship and um, by data scientists, mathematicians, and activists in this field. And I think until then, everything I had known about artificial intelligence had come from the mind of Steven Spielberg or Stanley Kubrick. And I don't think I really understood all of the ways that artificial intelligence is already becoming sort of an automated gatekeeper of opportunity, um, deciding, you know, you know, often the first line deciding opportunities of who gets hired, who gets health care, who gets undue police scrutiny. And what I learned in the making of coded bias was uh, that these same systems, you know, not just the extent to which human beings are outsourcing our decision making to machines, but through the research of Joy Bolamwini and Tanet Gebru and Deborah Raji, um, what I also learned is that these very same systems that are governing um, human destiny um, have not been vetted for racial bias or for gender bias or for discrimination or that they'll not do undue harm. Sometimes we haven't even agreed on, um, on a common standard of accuracy for these systems. And so that's when I began to see um, that every right that we hold dear as um, you know people of democracies, um, you know, sort of uh, fair housing, fair employ, fair access to opportunities, fair employment, um, uh, a fair healthcare system, all of those things, a, a fair criminal justice system that doesn't um, uh, give. Black people undo scrutiny uh, or, or reinforce uh, 
historic systematic inequalities. And what I realized in the making of this film is that AI has the capacity to roll back uh, almost invisibly through these black box systems that are often opaque to us. Um, all of the civil liberties that we've, all the advances we've made over 50 years. And that's um, sort of what not just sort of set me out on this journey, but also um, kept me making the film, um, this sort of, um, and, and, and then that's to say that, you know, in spite of that, um, I think in the making of the film, I also have a renewed hope because I think that it, it's still a hopeful film because a lot of the stories in Coded Bias are about everyday people who somehow manage to make a difference um, in the field of algorithmic justice. Yeah, and and I think um, I think that was one of the more powerful um, parts of the film for me is the storytelling and the real um, the real people talking about the real real harms. But I, I want to get to that a little later. I, I think you're you're bringing up um, you know you said democracy uh, multiple times, fair democracy, fair housing, fair opportunity. So is there something inherent in this kind of technology that lends itself to these types of harms or is it a question that you know technology is neither inherently neutral nor bad nor good um, but the way that it's used and the power that it serves um, needs to be needs to be unpacked right and i think dr um zainab to to fetch really gets at this um right like there there are benign technologies that are um being put towards an authoritarian state, right? So. Well, I think that Kathy O'Neill says it best when she says uh, algorithms are about power. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, all of the power has been on one side. All of the knowledge is on one side. And so all of the power has been on one side. I hope that coded bias sort of empowers us all with a basic literacy around these systems so that we can all feel engaged to ask questions and not leave this be afraid, oh my God, this is mathematics or this is um, big magic to me to sort of um, understand a little of, of the science of how these systems work. I think that um, one, it's a, it's, it, it becomes about power when it's a very small group of people making these decisions that are largely, I can speak for my own country here in the US, unregulated. Um, and so that gives all the power on one side. The other thing is that they're black boxes. We don't know how these systems exactly work. We know that they're kind of crunching, um, you know, um, statistics and data. But there's, you know, when Daniel Santos, a teacher who was um, arbitrarily rated a bad teacher, questioned these systems, he did so on the basis of it being a black box. Uh, he was denied his due process. If you're going to fire a teacher, or reprimand a teacher, uh, you should be able to show why. And this black box al algorithm that was evaluating them wasn't exactly able to say why. So I think that's uh, part of the issue. So it's it's the part that, you know, it's less than a 1% of the population that's designing these technologies that are deployed on all of us. And then the other part is that we can't see, we don't know. The other is that it's often opaque to us. Often we don't know when there's been in, you know, on your college admission, there might have been an algorithm involved in that first level of are the, were they crunching your SAT scores or your, um, you, you know, uh, you know, some standardized test to sort of be the first gatekeeper. There, there's often sometimes an AI involved in that we don't know. Um, you know, when you go for health insurance, is it actually an AI that sorted you into categories and prioritized your care? Oftentimes we don't know sometimes when an algorithm or a credit score where we've been denied credit or in, in my film that it shows, you know, Steve Wozniak's wife, had a different credit score than he did, even though they had all the same um, assets and all the same, you know, reported income. And 
why, why is that? And, you know, Steve Wozniak's wife, I imagine is going to be okay, <laughs> but for someone who actually needs that credit line, um, that can have a real consequence for someone. And she maybe would not have known to question it when, when we get a credit score or we get a credit rating or something like that. Um, those scores work a different way usually, but um, it, there, that was the Apple credit card example. But, um, and so I think those are all elements that call for what Ravi Nayak talks about is some balance to that unbridled power. Because you have an industry that's unregulated, that has some very powerful tools. And what I learned in the making of Coded Bias is that often uh, tech companies are just, just deploying this stuff with no guardrails in place, no legislation, no FDA, no sort of um, guidelines in place before they hit our streets and in, in our hands. And so that's sort of what the film is calling attention to, that that, that, that is a danger, that having that much power in the hands of that few people is, is dangerous. And also it's a, a, a power that can be hacked as we're seeing more and more and used by nefarious uh, players. Totally, um, there, there's so much to unpack there, but but I really wanna like zero in on this issue of regulation, right? And you, and you said it, for us to have due process um, and for protections to be enforced, there has to be a way to appeal these decisions, right? There has to be safeguards. Um, and in cases with clear and repeated human rights risk uh, and known harm, um, there has to be space for kind of like a public refusal of whether or not these are even, um, you know, often we think of law and policy coming in um, to fix or redress um, rather than a, a, a preventative. And that gets me to my question, which is that some of these issues have been addressed by companies themselves by implementing bans or moratoriums. And so mm -hmm. why do you think law and policy um, is so important here? And you know, Silky Carlo, I think it's um, in the film who really gets at this question, right? Like why we need to build robust structures in place rather than working backwards from um, tech or politics or, or outcome or harm. Mm -hmm. done. So companies like uh, Microsoft and Amazon have banned police use of their facial recognition, although the, the um, moratorium is set to expire in June of this coming year. So we'll see where that goes. Um, but is this enough? Like what's missing by focusing on corporate driven tech reform? Or when you say regulation, should it be democratic regulation? Like what can you? I, well, I think Silky Carlo is an interesting example because I was able to share those stories of how police were essentially experimenting with real-time facial recognition on citizens of the UK because the UK had laws and because they have the GDPR, which essentially starts to put data rights in a human rights framework that I, as you know, part journalist could even tell that story versus here in the US, um, our law enforcement is often using those same technologies uh, in secret without any disclosures. And there was a moment where um, Joy is test testifying before Congress and uh, Jim Jordan, a right wing Republican, is agreeing with AOC, a, a left wing <laughs> Democrat, because Jim Jordan says, well, wait a minute. 117 million Americans are in a police database that law enforcement can access without a warrant and no one um, elected is overseeing this process. And that's when I began to see, oh, like tech companies are selling this directly to the FBI to, to ICE, our immigration um, officials, and to police departments all over the US and no one that we elected um, said okay and is overseeing this. This is a big problem. This is like, this is like a huge way that police can overstep that law enforcement. And we don't even know. We know for the first time in the U.S. only because you know this stuff comes out by accident. Um, 
you know, by happenstance, let's say, um, a Detroit man was uh, arrested in front of his family and his neighbors, held for 30 hours, never asked for his license, um, all because of facial recognition. And it came out later. And in spite of that, the Detroit Police Department is continuing to use facial recognition. And so, um, you know, it's good that in June of this year, IBM said that they would stop researching, deploying. They, they were getting off facial recognition game. Microsoft said they would stop selling it to law enforcement and, and Amazon said they would put a one year pause on sale of um, facial recognition to law enforcement. But that didn't happen because the tech companies just found out about racial bias, right? It wasn't like, okay. oh, this is the moment we all discovered that there was yeah. racial bias in this technology. The research had been out for some time and they had been pre presented with this research, which Amazon had refuted a year earlier. Um, and so I, I think that what happened was you had brave scientists like Joy, like Tim Nick Gebru, who are um, uh, basically speaking, um, you know, letting the science speak for itself, unencumbered by corporate interest, and saying this invasive surveillance technology is racially biased and has gender bias. And also, it happened that change happened because engaged citizens took the streets, engaged people took the streets and said, um, we are drawing the connections between racially biased, invasive surveillance, facial recognition technology, and the inherent value of black life and communities that have been over policed and over scrutinized and over brutalized um, by law enforcement. And so um, I think those two things had to happen together, science and engaged, and engaged citizenry, engaged activism. And I think that um, when people always ask me about how will these, what do you think is gonna happen in the future? I'm like, I don't know, that's up to us. <laughs> like, it's up to us to say, let's first of all, get informed because it's not up to our, our legislators. I can speak for my own legislators. Um, don't know enough about how these technologies work. You have people in the U.S. Senate asking Mark Zuckerberg how they pay for Facebook. <laughs> and, and he has to explain, uh, we sell ads, Senator. <laughs> and so I, I feel like um, there's this huge disconnect, uh, you know, um, and it's up to us as, as people of a democracy. And we've, we've seen, you know, that this is not the time to be asleep as people of a democracy, that we have to participate and get educated. And I think artificial intelligence for so long, we've sort of left to the billionaires. And I feel like uh, these technologies are gonna touch everything we love and everything we care about. And it's up to us to be informed and to push our legislators to make decisions um, to infuse our values in into um, the governance of these technologies. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I think you're spot on. Like it's historically, it's it's the public that has in the face of, you know, at times insurmountable odds um, held that power to account and called on governments. And so I do have faith in the public as well. And maybe we can get to some more specific questions around that um, in a little bit. I wanted to pick up on, on this notion that, and we see it here in Canada as well, right? The the problem of legislators um, being, um, not being pri privy to the black box of, tech, of algorithmic decision-making, right? So, and one of the, I think, productive things that's come out of this tech lash, this public backlash um, within this movement is this, you know, renewed interest in the, in the ethics of technology and the social impact of technology. Um, there's definitely been a lot of academic engagement and public engagement around the issue of bias, um, but what, do, and efficiency. So what does, you know, is, is the problem when we get in front of policymakers that, okay, look, there's an accuracy issue, um, people of different uh, racial, gender, and class minorities are being misrecognized. Uh, what, what does an, an efficient or successful algorithmic system do? Um, well, I think that um, right now we have a system where it hits the streets 
and then we talk about whether it's fair or not and whether it'll cause harm or not. That seems to be a little bit backwards. I can't imagine like if we had pharmaceuticals, <laughs> you yes. know, or, or like, the, you know, and I, and I like how Kathy O'Neill talks about it like a um, FDA for algorithms because, you know, I love technology. Like the fact that I believe in an FDA doesn't mean I don't like food. It means that you believe that there should be certain standards of quality and safety before you put it out. And to me, um, that involves experts. Like I am not the one who's gonna vet food and drugs to see if the quality is correct. And, you know, you and I didn't probably look that carefully at the terms and conditions of Zoom before we got on. We kind of just were like, I have this meeting, I got to get to it. I'm not checking what my civil, how my civil rights are being violated by this platform or not. And so I feel like it should be up to our governments to say, these are the standards. Now we have to use Zoom for my child to go to math class. It isn't just a nice to have, right? It, it's, it's, and that child should not have to choose between going to math class and having their data being stored forever by a private company. And so, and what, and selling it or what is going to happen to that data. And so to me, it's, um, bias is part of it. But I think as Joy makes the point so well in the film that it's not just about um, bias, like with facial recognition, if we had perfect facial recognition, then we'd have perfect invasive surveillance. Is that what we want? Um, you know, it's also about thinking about how these systems are deployed. And um, just because, you know, we can have the kind of surveillance that makes the Stasi look like they had a light touch doesn't mean we necessarily should. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, the, the, you know, bias is only part of it. Mm -hmm. Some of it is about, um, you know, I, I think technology companies often talk about it as, oh, it's just, we have to create, you know, better data sets and we'll solve it. And then we'll have the perfect algorithm. And to me, it's not about building the perfect algorithm. It's about what kind of society do we want to have? Um, how do we build a more humane society? And I think those are more of the questions we need to ask um, around what we're losing in this race to efficiency. Is, is efficiency actually the goal? Yeah, I, I think that's such an important question to ask, is, it, is efficiency the goal? Um, and it's a question that's difficult at times to put in front of legislators and, and policymakers. And I think part of the barrier from the conversations that, that we've had and the work that we've done here at the center, part of the barriers um, is this issue of cost and convenience. And, and that comes up really well in your film as well. Um, there's a young um, woman in China who is talking about how convenient some of these systems are and it saves her time. Um, and it makes her life easier. And certainly there's companies like, you know, Clearview AI that were providing police services to Canada, um, to several police departments, including the RCMP. And many companies will provide free service. So that's like another layer of um, how do you say no to, hey, you can just use our service and um, mm -hmm. maybe we'll store things in a database and maybe we won't. But so don't get me wrong, this, this question of like cost and benefit um, and efficiency and what does success look like, it's, it's so important, but what's maybe beyond um, thinking of technology in this cost benefit way? And I, and I think you point to it really brilliantly at the very last scene of the film, which is my, my personal favorite, but is there something about the way we imagine technology um, that can go beyond this? cost, benefit, good versus bad um, narrative. Yes, I mean, I think that, um, I love the example of China because I feel like I'm not having judgment. I understand that there is that in all of us where I'm like, you don't think about it, about it. You're like, oh my God, I pressed a button and a car came to my house. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's kind of incredible what technology can do. 
But I also think that uh, we haven't thought about yet. Um, I think, you know, in the making of this film, I also think that we've had a stunning limitation um, of imagination around these technologies because they've been dominated by surveillance capitalism. And we don't really have an open market for AI per se, because you have companies like Facebook and Google um, who have had a 10 year head start on data. That's why Amy Webb writes about the big nine and how uh, these AI companies are the main companies because they've had this nine year or 10 year head start, you know, of the world's data. And so um, it would be hard for a mom and pop shop of AI to really have this sort of free market of innovation. Uh, we rarely see, I won't speak for Canada, but in the US, what an AI for social good would look like. What would that even look like? What would those programs even look like? What would AI look like outside of the business model of surveillance capitalism. We've been sort of taught by these companies that them um, not giving us any money for limitless use of our data and uh, in the States, you know, get to store it forever is the only way that this system can work. That seems like a stunning lack of imagination to me of how these systems can work. Um, that being said, um, you know, what they would say is like, well, this is free. This is, you know, there could be different ways of doing this. Would I pay a premium to know that my information had some integrity and was coming from vetted sources? Absolutely. If I could like pay a monthly fee and know that my searches were somehow linked to newspapers and public libraries and I was getting some sort of integrity as a researcher, that would be amazing if there's some way of like knowing what search was prioritizing. Am I getting commercial searches? Am I getting things that are library? Am I getting stuff like it would be helpful to those things would be helpful to understand. But I think that um, this business model has been limiting, um, limiting and the fact that we don't have more inclusion um, has been limiting the imagination about how these very powerful technologies can be um, designed. Yeah, I, 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 and it's nice that we're veering into, um, you know, the role of, of imaginaries and uh, the arts, um, because I think that's the other piece to the law and policy, right? Um, and we talked about public engagement and informing the public and informing our policymakers, and that's, that's a huge part, right? So, in, Joy, in Joy's own experience, she describes how she began her investigation um, of facial recognition technologies through this project that's really at the intersection um, of science fiction and computer science, right? She took a class called Science Fabrications and that got her into making this mirror that would inspire you um, when you looked at it uh, in the morning um, by overlaying you know, your hero or like a lion's face on, on top of your image, which is like very imaginative. And it's it points exactly to, to what you're talking about. So how how do you believe the arts, um, you know, whether it's film or media, fine art, um, whatever, but how, how do you feel that this space can inform and, and push that conversation around fair and accountable um, governance and development of tech, which traditionally seems so separated and antithetical to one another, but you've brought them together in such a brilliant way in the film. So can you speak a little more? Well, yeah, absolutely. I think that Joy being an artist in the film plays a role in her ability to be able to communicate the issue so well and using different platforms like poetry to sort of communicate to audience that may not would maybe feel alienated by a subject like artificial intelligence. It doesn't invite everyone to be mm -hmm. part of the conversation. And I certainly, as a filmmaker, make films because I believe that films and the arts um, make a difference. Through art, you have this um, experience of empathy. You empathize with someone um, oftentimes uh, who's different than you, who comes from a different place, who's um, has a different set of life experiences. And I am a believer that, that through that 
uh, process of empathy is like sort of the spark for social change. It's, it's the fact that you not just know what someone else is going through, but can actually feel, empathize. Oh my God, what, what that must feel like um, to not be seen by, by an AI, what that must feel like to be subject to invasive surveillance when you're just trying to go uh, through your, your home. And so um, it's my belief that art um, can be a powerful way to engage in conversations that uh, change the world. Um, totally, and and we have an example of it um, right here in the film, right? So, and and it's interesting you bring up empathy because the role of images and the camera, more specifically, um, has been so intimately tied to to growing that that empathy and to showing um, and to showing different perspectives. And and then on the other hand, images have also historically been at the center of struggles of power, right? Even if we think of painting and like iconoclasm and um, police composites and, and national registries for population control and, and things like this. Um, you know, there's obvious ways that training data sets and this new and complex, uh, what, what is often packaged to us and marketed as this very new and mystical and magical um, sophisticated, you know, AI, it often draws on and pulls from this, this longer history. Um, so can you talk a little more about how that gets reproduced and about that sort of magic of, of tech and our, our faith and trust in tech that comes up a few times in the, in the film? Like we have this blind trust in, in big data. Yes. I mean, absolutely. I mean, you see in the film that the, the data set uh, of these programs that were already being sold to the FBI and already being sold to law enforcement um, had been trained on mostly uh, white, mostly male faces. And so uh, sort of uh, came to replicate the biases in the data sets. And so I think that that is incredibly, um, I mean, I can even just talk about this really standing next to Joy and the computer did see my face. And, you know, even viscerally, you know, knowing that at the time that the constitution of the US was signed that black people were only thought of as three fifths of a human being. And then being, you know, sort of standing next to someone who's African-American and literally not being seen as a human being um, by a computer uh, is actually quite uh, stunning and goes to show how these systems can, you know, uh, replicate human bias and that we can't trust them. And the other thing is that they're often sold to us to do things that they actually can't do. Like, you know, uh, there are companies that say that you can actually, um, you know, read someone's facial expressions and know whether they'll be a good candidate for a job. Well, that's pseudoscience. It's not science at all. And like a woman who had Botox and her face was like a little tight. And so they, they like the, the, pseudoscience said like, oh, she's aggressive. And so it, it just goes to show how these technologies um, can be biased, can be oversold, um, you know, and sometimes the, the, the people who invent them don't oversell them, but the people who are at these companies who are actually selling these technical devices are. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's really interesting you bring up that example because AI straddles this at once um, very rational scientific um, investment, like a social investment that we have in, in technology and data and ob objectivity and, and all of these other things. But then also um, on the other hand, this there's this like pseudoscientific side um, or this magical side. Well, it doesn't it doesn't even know how it does it, but it just, it does it and it does it so perfectly. Um, and so that's why the, the notion of visibility and like unearthing these, these issues is so key here. And so 
I'm just wondering on the point of, of visibility, um, we had a question submitted to us in advance by um, cast member Kathy O'Neill, who, as you mentioned, is the author of the widely popular Weapons of Math Destruction. Um, she's also a mathematician. Uh, she worked as a professor, a hedge fund analyst in a, in a previous life. Um, and a data scientist, and she also founded Orca, which is an algorithmic auditing company. Um, and she wants to know what kind of algorithms and algorithmic harm might be happening with systems that are harder to perceive and therefore harder to investigate than- uh, Why is Kathy asking me this question when this is like a question for Kathy? Like she is the PhD from Harvard. This I think she trusts not fair. fair. This is so not fair. But I will answer um, the the answer the question that she is, has greater qualifications to answer. Um, I think that Kathy's book and so many of the other systems. I mean, a lot of people talk about facial recognition because it's uh, the easiest to see. But Kathy shows all kinds of ways in her book uh, that these systems are being used, like through the value added model on teachers. Um, it can be used oftentimes they're bringing attention to sometimes when they're doing um, hiring algorithms and trying to match a candidate with a job. Um, sometimes she's like, how, how are these systems working? Are they fair? Um, and I think because she has advanced degrees in mathematics and um, she certainly like tried to explain to me how the equation for pi was knitted in a sweater. I mean, she's really on some other um, advanced learning <laughs> um, in the field. I think that I think that um, she begins to sort of unpack a lot of the way things that we have trust in, you know, and something as simple as a Google search and how the logics of that work. So it's literally every system that, that, that uses an algorithm, which these days is, is everything. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned, you, you know, uh, Kathy O'Neill is a cast member. You also have brilliant women, Meredith Broussard, um, Silco Carly, uh, Dr. Zainab Tufetki and, and others. I want to ask, and I ask this question with the knowledge that the other side of the question rarely gets asked, but I'm going to ask it anyway because it's very important. But um, why was it so important to have an almost all female led, almost all women led cast um, and to be intentional about that inclusion in this particular space? I actually wasn't. I actually didn't hmm. set out to, to um, tell a film that was mostly women and mostly people of color. It's just that the research kept let lead, that's who is leading the fight for bias in AI. And that is sort of um, who shows up in the film. And so um, I, I think that being the kind of filmmaker I am, I also uh, could see that um, not only is most of the cast incredibly astute, amazing data scientists and mathematicians, but also are women of color um, and uh, people of color and women and um, who had a, an experience of being marginalized and had their experience not centered and therefore could see bias in this technology that many of us may have missed. Yeah, um, and and there must have been obstacles in in creating this film as a as an artist and a filmmaker, um, and and as a woman working to to add uh, expertise to the the area of AI and and kind of to belie the unchecked power of of big tech. I'm sure it was um, not an easy feat to to get this movie done. So if you uh, want to talk a little bit about any obstacles you face. It was incredibly challenging. I always yeah. joke that I couldn't talk to people for two years because I was worried someone would ask me what I was working on and I couldn't really, I would sort of scratch my head and say like, well, I'm making a movie about racist robots. <laughs> and now I feel like there's uh, been more material and the film is sort of doing its own heavy lifting. But uh, 
to my knowledge, there had never been a film about algorithmic bias. There was no, um, it wasn't like there were five films in the field that I could reference. And so I think the scholarship itself was incredibly challenging and trying to um, make subject matter that was very dense and abstract um, be, um, you know, a cinematic and, and entertaining, um, connecting those stories to stories that are emotional. And then also, you know, trying to make the abstract visible, trying to, you know, the science communication itself. And I sort of draw from the language of, of science fiction. That's really interesting. I'd love to know what you're currently, uh, what sci-fi you're currently digging into, but we have a question from the audience actually. So I'm gonna take a question from Miguel Dobrich um, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, who asks, do you feel that the coded bias experience will reframe the subjects that you focus on um, in the near future uh, as a documentary director and also as a citizen? Um, the subjects I chose will reframe uh, do you feel that the coded bias experience uh, will reframe the subjects that you focus on? Um, so how do you think that Joy and some of the other cast members are, are seen in a, in a different light? Are they seen as more artists and documentary filmmakers? Well, I, I, I hope that, um, I hope that the film will shine a light on their important work and see them not as um, isolated, um, sort of stories, but as, um, you know, sort of a movement that is happening within AI. And I think hopefully situating all these stories together gives them some weight that this is like sort of a movement happening um, within artificial intelligence. This is a canon of people speaking out. And, and I hope that the, that the film shines a light on their important scholarship and, and gets you all to read their important books, which are, are listed on, on the codedbias.com website. Yeah, and th those books are, are fantastic. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, you know, one of, one of the better and more powerful things that the film did is, is leave viewers with a sense of, like I was energized after watching it. I was like, okay, what else um, can we do? Um, how do we talk about this? Let's have more conversations. So I wanted to ask, how do we talk about the harms um, in a way that motivates action and that informs the public about these very real impacts of surveillance tech, um, but that also empowers and, and kind of energizes the, the public who's shaping and reshaping this tech, right? And it's a difficult question. Like it's-, well, it's been... Yeah, well, I make films because I think films change the world. So I would say uh, host a screening of Coded Bias um, have your friends talk about it. There's a discussion guide and an activist toolkit on the site. Um, go to the Take Action page. There's a bunch of organizations doing great work in the field. Um, use it to talk to a part of it that you're excited about. Maybe you're excited about healthcare. Maybe you're excited about law enforcement. Um, talk about algorithmic justice at the intersection of that issue because it's going to touch everything. Uh, education, you know, maybe you want to uh, look at further into the value added model. I think that um, I hope that coded bias will be kind of an inconvenient truth, the kind of film that gives people basic information. I don't know a faster way where you can spend an hour and 15 minutes and get an overview of sort of the issues and the ethics and sort of get some of the personal stories. And so um, that personally is my. Um, my way to do it and then support some of the great work that's being done out there. Um, organizations like Silky Carlos, Big Brother Watch, um, the ACLU, um, um, other organizations like Amnesty International that are working more internationally. Um, they, uh, you know, organizations like that are doing great work with very little resources and they all need our support. And, um, you know, even if you have no resources, being able to volunteer time or do a letter stuffing for them, um, all of that makes a difference. And then also looking at your campus as a place for activism. I think when people um, start to talk about um, 
change when they're talking about big global change or federal change, it feels like it's impossible. But if you're just talking about, why don't we just do a facial recognition ban at our university? Uh, that's something that you can do. Um, uh, that is, and, and once you do that, um, you know, that this is a safe base uh, pledge that we're not gonna be surveyed or, you know, we look into, hey, what's happening with all our data now that all our classes are online? Or like, you know, maybe we make that a project. And so just being, um, just being uh, questioning, knowing that, that you have a role to sit at the table, that this isn't just big tech and big magic, that you have a right to question these systems, I think is, is, is the beginning. Yeah, I, I, I think that's so important. Um, and, and it gets us to, to kind of a, a question of how students who are not um, in computer science or in data science can engage with these systems. And, you know, I think it's uh, Sophia Noble who, who talks about in the film, the way that we get at the impact of these technologies is, is oh, sorry, the way that we understand these technologies that are black boxed uh, is by looking at the outcomes. Um, so, students who are not necessarily in computer and STEM and data science fields can certainly ask these questions and, and, and engage with these issues um, as, as the film so clearly shows. I wanted to maybe touch on what has changed since filming the, the movie because we're in such a particular cultural and historical, and by particular, I mean like very bizarre time in the world right now where many things are happening. And I just, um, you know, I'm reminded Zora Neale Hurston once wrote, there are years that ask questions and there are years that answer. Um, so oh, where, okay. yeah, oh, she's just, she's just, and she's a whole other. Um, but based on your experience um, in this work and, and on AI and its impact, where do you think we are at the moment? Oh, we're just at the beginning of asking the question. We don't even know what the question is. I think that that is definitely uh, where we are with AI. Like we don't even know uh, who to ask the question to. <laughs> I, I, I feel like we're just at the very beginning of this. Uh, we see some steps forward and some steps back. Certainly I was disheartened to see Tim Gabru at, at AI ethics at Google be fired. That was astounding, that was genius that Google couldn't afford to lose. Um, so that was very um, disconcerting. So I feel like um, we're just at the very beginning of the conversation and the cement is really just uh, still wet and it's up to us to really decide how these technologies will be used. Yeah, I, I would agree with you that we're we're definitely at the beginning of this. Um, but recently, we've we've seen more conversations about the use of facial recognition technology to help identify folks that were um, at the Capitol Hill riots on January sixth. And so, one of my questions is, how do we kind of um, navigate, or how do we rather ask the right kinds of questions um, of technology when? some uses are deemed as, as potentially, you know, good use of technology and especially ones for democratic um, safety and uh, security and, and other narratives. Well, I'm not sure that facial recognition actually helped us at the Capitol, um, that the, the jury is still in on that. Um, that's like a whole other thing. But what I will say is like, we should just press pause until we have some rules on it. Um, I would say, here's what I know for sure. The tech companies shouldn't be the ones who get to decide. Law enforcement on re without anyone elected should, shouldn't be the ones to decide. In my opinion, we the people should be the ones to decide if there are uses of it, either through our elected officials that have some governance or through us directly telling our official, it's like, hey, this is when I think it should be used and shouldn't be used. Um, that's that's really what what I should think, what I think. And, and also that this is like very sensitive data. This is like, if you were gonna get fingerprinted or genetic test, um, the police would need a, a warrant. They would need some sort of exactly. way to 
you know, track that information, there would be some limitations on how long they can store it, their rules. Your biometric data is so personal. It's your, your, your personal signifier. And it is, I think, what Joy Bellamini talks about as the last frontier of our privacy. And, and we have to have some rules and um, we should decide collectively when it gets used. Mm -hmm. Me, the question isn't when it gets used. My question is like, who gets to decide when it gets used? Exactly. And to me, it is, it's, it's elected. It should be elected people. Exactly. I was hoping. I was hoping we would leave off on a on a strong um, statement on on the public and and I think the movie does does that in so many um, you know both nuanced and and other ways and one of which is that you steer away from this framing of trade off of like security and privacy and there's such a focus on power um, instead of privacy. Um, and I think that that comes across very powerfully. But I think we have time for one more question. And I'm going to ask, it's a question submitted by Ravi Naik, who is a cast member and legal director of AWO, which is a new data rights agency in the UK that provides legal and public policy services to organizations and individuals. Um, so Ravi asks, the film portrays the powerful work of incredibly powerful women to hold facial recognition technology to account. That technology seems like a forebearer to designs that big tech have on smart cities. I would love to know your take on where we may be heading with smart cities and if our heroines in the film are making inroads to challenge the developing technology of our built environment. So I'm not sure if Ravi knows something uh, we don't, but. Yeah, I think Ravi knows, again, I don't know why they're asking me questions that they're more qualified to answer, but um, Ravi Naik is amazing human rights lawyer in the UK. And I think he, you know, this kind of, he's talking about how ubiquitous all our information is gonna be when our refrigerator knows that we're out of milk. And um, so, you know, what's gonna happen as more and more of our um, intimate devices become wired with the internet and that data is uh, being transmitted through all kinds of um, companies and being bought and sold and packaged together to create a complete profile of us. And I think what he's talking to is, is sort of the, the, the threat. I mean, Silky Carlo talks about what happens when our CCT net networks get wired with real-time facial recognition and everywhere we go during the day is being recorded by the state. It probably already is by our, our, the, our company, but now it is by the state. And so, um, you know, it really goes to show like what I was saying, how ubiquitous these technologies can be and how intimate um, and increasingly intimate we will interact with them. And so um, it's just very important that we all play a role in understanding them and educating ourselves in, in how these technologies work and ultimately, um, you know, engaging with, with our, um, with our legislators on, and on, on to um, communicate the values and, and, and to show that we want ethical and humane uses of these very powerful technologies. Yeah, and, and you brought up, um, it's funny that you brought up the smart fridge um, because it's one thing for your fridge to, you know, like recommend you ice cream because you're out of ice cream and it's another to store data on when you are the most emotional or angry because you're hungry and then serve you an ad that may nudge you um, in, a, in a certain way um, or towards a certain political um, goal. So um, I could spend an entire panel talking about that, but we don't have time. So I would just um, like to just thank you once again for taking time and joining us today. And a big thanks to our viewers. Um, who, uh, for their thoughtful questions and remarks. Um, this was very engaging. And uh, if you want to learn more about these conversations, uh, please check out codedbias.com um, and more on our website, mediatechdemocracy.com, where we'll have events and projects uh, specifically in our facial recognition governance page. Um, so thank you very much, Shalini. And um, I, I wish you all the success with this campaign and more. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for your time. Have a good one. Bye-bye.